Welcome everyone to the latest installment of CSSW's Writing Lives Roundtables, uh, in which our accomplished colleagues take part in discussions about their lives as writers, describing their approaches, their challenges, and their strategies for success. Um, it's always a lot of fun. And today we're joined by a stellar panel of presenters uh, who have wide ranging experiences writing for funding in and outside of academia through government, foundations, and corporate research grants, as well as nonprofit fundraising and development, marketing, and communications. Our panelists are going to offer their invaluable perspectives on writing for funding in social work, which is so crucial to the knowledge we produce, the organizations we partner with, and the programs and services that we implement. So I want to thank you so much uh, to the, our, the director of our writing center, Adam Pellegrini, whom you saw a moment ago, and also to Professor Jean Gao for organizing this great panel and for everything they do for our community. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Your presence affirms that you too see writing as an essential part of social work practice across fields and methods, as well as a tool for advocacy while securing essential resources for projects that will be meaningful to the communities we serve. Now, our goal for today's event is to afford you new strategies for success in your own writing lives and to inspire writing that contributes to positive change. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists and invite them to make a few opening remarks as soon as I've done with the introductions. First uh, is my colleague, Dr. Courtney Cogburn. Dr. Cogburn is an associate professor of social work and a member of our senior faculty who also serves in a newly created role of special advisor to the dean. Dr. Cogburn's innovative and transdisciplinary work on conceptualizing and measuring racism and strategies to reduce racism contributes significantly to our school's research, teaching, and service missions. Next is my colleague, Dr. Alyssa Davis, an associate professor at CSSW who conducts epidemiological research to improve marginalized populations' healthcare access and to reduce HIV, STI, TB, and drug abuse. Dr. Davis also develops interventions for vulnerable populations, including those involved in the criminal justice system, both domestically and internationally. Lenara Davidson Greenwich is our Associate Dean for Communication Strategy, Development, and Alumni Affairs. She's an exceptional leader who's integrating efforts to enhance our school's communications, our fundraising efforts, and alumni engagement. And she brings a wealth of experience from the public, nonprofit, government, and private sectors to her work. Last, certainly not least, I am pleased to welcome Anjali Singla. Professor Singla is a member of our wonderful adjunct faculty and is an experienced fundraising and grant management professional with expertise in public health, youth development, and healthcare. She serves as the Chief Development Officer for the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, an organization dedicated to building power with AAPI women and girls to influence critical decisions that affect their lives, their families, and their communities. Um, this is a great group of folks. I've been looking forward to this tremendously. Um, I'm delighted you're all here and I, I can't wait to jump into our discussion. So I'd like to invite each person um, to just say a few opening remarks if they would like to, and uh, we'll, we'll go in alphabetical order. And so uh, Dr. Courtney Cogburn, that puts you up first. Okay, hi everyone. Delighted to be here with you and uh, talk about this important topic. I think it's an area that's not intuitive and uh, any and advice and support you can get from people who've gone through the experience will be very, very useful. It certainly has been for me. Um, so I was asked to just briefly talk about experiences, challenges, and strategies as it relates to this type of writing. So I primarily target or have experience working with uh, federal private foundations and gifts. I tend to target funding that supports uh, innovative, creative, big idea kinds of projects, which often means that federal funding is not the place to start for me. Uh, federal funding often want you to have a well-established area of research and not necessarily uh, taking big risks on something new. So depending on where you are and what type of project you're doing, uh, federal funding may not be the best fit. Uh, because I take on these innovative big idea type projects, I often don't have all the skills I need to launch the project. I need to work with people with other areas and different types of expertise and work across multiple disciplines, which can create challenges in terms of communicating effectively uh, to different kinds of audiences. Um, what are you doing? Why is it important? Why is it necessary to involve all of these different people? And how do you integrate the way people think and talk across multiple disciplines, and then clearly communicate that to a single funder. 
Um, so that's one of the challenges that I have experienced explaining complex ideas and the utility um, and expressions of transdisciplinary teams. Um, and also, how do you propose feasible big idea projects, right? I could say I want to end racism. What does that mean? How do you actually do that? What's the steps along the way to get to that? So how do you go from uh, an idea pie in the sky to something that's actually something that you can implement? Uh, some of the strategies that I have focused on have really been about fit. So identifying funders whose values and priorities are very closely aligned with things that I want to do. Um, so considering whether the work that I would propose is the right fit is really, really important. Um, I'm sure everyone on the panel today will say you need to consult with the PO or someone who's very familiar with the funding priorities for the mechanism that you're applying for. They can provide you really important insight into whether what you're proposing is the right fit or really within the realm of what they're focused on. So a project may say we're interested in racism and health, or a funding mechanism may say we're interested in uh, funding projects related to racism and health. That's actually a very, very broad idea. If you talk to the PO, you might get some more specific insights in terms of what they're interested in focusing on. So I'll stop there. I was only asked to spend a couple of minutes introing some of these areas, and I look forward to our discussion. That's a great start. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and next up, uh, Dean Greenwich. We have a few words you'd like to share with our, our audience today. Sure. Uh, well, thank you first, um, Adam and team, for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. I'm super excited um, to, to be here with my colleagues to have this conversation. And, and I feel like Courtney has done a great job of kind of providing the context, right? And so I'm not going to uh, to say much more, um, except for this point, uh, because I, I do both um, fundraising and marketing and comms. And, and so the difference uh, I find um, in, in the ways in which I, I have to write for both is that for, for funders, you have to get to the point as quickly as possible, right? There's not a lot of flowery language that you're trying that you will try and use um, to, to, to write these grants. And, um, and it's important to kind of both combine storytelling and lifting up the the um, the area that you're looking to uh, to to solve or support with the data and then the next steps that you are um, that you're hoping to, to utilize um, with with the resources um, and so getting straight to the point I think is 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 one important piece but I also think that sometimes we have this idea that we are writing grants or or proposals for foundations to um, to like non-existent individuals on the other end of the of the uh, uh, realm, right? Um, but but it's actually people that we are writing to and for, and so relationships always matter in these instances as well. Um, I don't at this point in my career very often just um, send a cold proposal without trying to find someone that I can speak to first, right? Uh, um, to ensure that, as, as Dr. Cardboard has said, that we are, that what we are looking to do is in alignment. Um, and then lastly, I also find that because we are so eager to get funding and, and find new places uh, for, for funding, we tend to write proposals for programs that don't exist um, without taking into consideration the difficulty it is to create a new program, even if you have funding to start it, right? Um, and so wanting to be mindful that um, not all money is created equal in that way um, and, and wanting to ensure that when you're going after something, you're going after something, um, you're going after resources for ideas that you either want to implement or already exist, right? Um, um, or that, that you are already working on um, so that you can uh, continue to move forward. Um, um, and so it's, it's important for fundraisers and then those that are going to be executing on the programming, right, um, are working hand in hand to ensure that we're not creating more work for them um, um, by mistake. That's terrific, Lenora. Thank you very much. Uh, next, it's a pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Davis. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And it's great to see you all and so many people interested in this topic. Um, like so many other things in life, writing for funding is a skill that takes a lot of practice. 
I mostly submit to NIH funding, but I've also submitted um, grant applications to nonprofit organizations as well. And I think regardless of the type of funding opportunity you're applying for, there are some main tips that I would suggest. So the first I would say is start early. It takes a lot of time to write grants, especially if you're applying for large amounts of funding, um, including governmental funding opportunities. These types of grants tend to have a lot of different components and you usually need more time than you originally anticipate, especially if you're new to writing grants. So if you're writing these larger types of grants, I would try to give yourself at least four months if possible. If you're applying for smaller um, grants for, for new um, foundational projects, then maybe you can do it in a month or two, depending on what the funding requirements are. Um, and as Courtney and Lenar and others have said on the call, know your funders priorities and please, please try to find someone who's applied there before to talk with. It's so incredibly helpful. Every type of grant application is different depending on the funder that you're applying to. And so it's important to try and talk with someone at the organization and then also try to talk with someone um, who's applied there before. If possible, it will really um, help you out and also check back regularly because funding priorities change. Um, so for example, the focus of many institutes at NIH is shifting and there have been a lot of funding calls go out recently for topics of interest that traditionally fall within the domain of social work, including for funding for community organizations specifically. Uh, so for example, there was an NIH funding announcement in February for community organizations to develop, implement, evaluate and disseminate community-led health equity interventions, and community organizations are the ones who had to be the applicant organization for that call. So whether you're planning on going into research or you're planning to work in the nonprofit um, sphere, definitely pay attention to these shifts in um, funding streams because I think they are favorable to social work and there's a lot more increased recognition about the importance of community work. And then the third thing I would say is to expect failure, but persistence pays off. So it is very, very common not to get funded on your first grant submission or even your second or sometimes your third. I have submitted more grants that have not been funded than grants that have been funded. It's all part of the process. The more you write grants, the better you get and realize that even if your grant doesn't get funded on the first time, that effort isn't wasted. You can take what you've written and revamp it and resubmit it to a funding opportunity later down the road. And a lot of these funding opportunities sometimes come out really quickly, especially for special calls. Maybe there's only two or three months to put together an application. And if you're trying to find new collaborators at that point, that's really not enough time. But you, if you have a grant that you previously worked on that wasn't funded, then it's a lot easier to switch that around quickly and kind of retailor that for a specific funding announcement. So don't get discouraged if you don't get funded on your first time. We've all been there and we, we understand. You know, truer words ever spoken. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and, and Professor Singla, uh, some introductory remarks, if you would like. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this panel with all of you today. I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I would just add two things. One is that um, I, if I, thinking about this, if I reflect back to myself in high school or college, I did not like writing. So the fact that I'm part of this uh, conversation today, I think I, I would shock myself. Um, so I share that because for folks who are hesitant about writing or don't see the value of it or don't see how powerful it can be, um, I want to share that it can be very powerful and it can be a very useful tool. And don't get discouraged because um, you can you can become successful at it. Like as Dr. Davis said, you know, with perfection and time. Um, you can perfect. The other thing I would say, um, exactly as my colleague just said about, um, you know, applications being rejected, not to take it personally, because fun, funding applications can be so competitive. So even if it's not about um, your proposal, it's not being funded, it's not because it's not worthy, the cause isn't worthy, the project isn't worthy, the timeline isn't worthy, it's that there's so much competition. So I've been in situations where we, there was complete alignment between the funder and what the program was, 
and it was more about just the, the nature of the services that were being offered. So there was more of a, a prioritization for other services versus what we were offering. So even if you don't get funded on the first time or you don't get funded from a funder, you can always ask for feedback and it can be really helpful in terms of being able to I just want to share a couple of those questions as well as just digging in with all of this. Thank you for sharing that, Anjali. And now we're going to open it up to the whole roundtable. Um, and while most of the questions um, are going to pertain to writing for funding, I'd like to start with sort of a, a more general question. Um, you've, you've each referred to some of the challenges uh, that you encounter specifically for uh, writing for funding, but just think about writing in general. What strategies have you learned that you often use um, to, to employ effective writing and, and how did you learn them? So anybody want to jump in about your strategies for writing? I, I paid a coach a lot of money to uh, drag me through the process. I have a tense relationship with, with writing. Anjali, I can relate that it's not something I've always enjoyed. Um, I usually do once I get into a flow, but getting started and then continuing the pace can be challenging for me. So having an accountability partner, having someone I can use as a sounding board, uh, both in terms of the content of the writing, but just my process and what is my relationship with writing has been really, really helpful. So you don't always have to pay someone. I think you can use your peers, your colleagues as that type of, of resource, your lab members, if you're part of a research group, for instance, as that type of sounding board as well. That's been incredibly helpful for me. That wasn't what I expected you to say at the start. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Others? Yeah, Lenora. Amen. So I, I'm actually one of those, those people that loves writing. I thought that I was going to either be a singer or a writer from a very young age. Um, and so writing is something that I do for fun in addition to, to, to work. Um, and it, but there, I'm I'm in a, a different season in my life right now where I can't. Um, I think at some point, you know, I I would have a ritual where I would sit down for a couple of hours and try and, and put some drafts together, and that's just not um, how how life works at this point. And so there, um, there is a book that I love that I recently that I read about a few years ago by Anne Lamott called Bird by Bird, uh, and the book uh, is about writing, but also just how best to live life. And she has many one-liners there that are amazing. Uh, but the one that I actually have printed on my desk right now in a very small frame is just that bird by bird. With the idea being that um, uh, the story in the book is about her brother who had a, a, a big project due um, around uh, the history of birds and he waited until the night before to do it and so was panicking. And as his father was helping him um, put together this project for for his deadline he said you know buddy don't don't worry about it we'll, we'll take it bird by bird right just um take it easy and we'll do it bird by bird so this idea being that um your first draft is always your worst draft right um and it's also important just to get it out um and um and and be kind to yourself in those moments right uh, and so to get it out walk away and then come back um, and you will be able to see it with uh, fresher eyes. Um, and, and if you allow yourself a, just a small amount of time, right? And so that, again, for me, this bird by bird idea is, um, let me just sit down and write for five minutes to take the pressure off. I don't, I have no idea what's going to come out, but if I write for five minutes, I at least feel successful in, in moving forward um, in some shape, way or form. Um, and then I may be inspired to do more, but if not, I have five minutes worth of writing to then come back to. And so bird by bird is uh, is, is the, my mantra these days. Thank you. Um, Anjali, yeah. Yeah, I, that was great. I am um, thinking about what you were saying. I'm thinking about um, sometimes I start with like the end in mind. So maybe like I may not have all the sections figured out, but I may have like what my objective is so that I can at least figure out the pieces to get there. And I think the feedback is great. Like, I think you can always walk away from writing and then have a fresh start. But I think at the same time, you have to be able to hand it in at some point. You have to be able to walk away, which I think is hard. Because writing is easy. Yeah, I would agree with all of what everyone else has said. I think it's important to figure out also what time of day works for you in terms of writing. 
and then make sure to block out that time on your calendar. Um, I wasn't doing that before, but it's important to block time out for yourself and treat it like a meeting. So when that's blocked out, no one else can interrupt your time. Um, and I also agree with breaking things down into smaller tasks that you can complete more quickly. Um, so even if it's just my task for today is to write one paragraph in an introduction section, that helps to move things along. Otherwise, things can become really overwhelming. Um, and I think, yeah, it's just showing up and writing. And some days you'll be more productive than others and other days not. But um, I have a colleague who used to say the most important body part for writing is your butt. It's not your brain, but it's your butt. Your butt has to be in the chair and you have to be writing in order to get things done. So one of the professors at my grad when I was in grad school would have BIS on her calendar and she would hold time. That's butt in seat. And she wouldn't explain <laughs> what that meant to people, but she was busy and you couldn't interrupt that time. Yeah. <laughs> Really terrific tips, and I am taking notes um, myself, uh, having faced writer's block on many occasions. Uh, so your, these tips are really useful. Um, so now diving into the to the funding aspect of this, as opposed to writing in general, how would you characterize um, writing for funding as opposed to other types of writing that you've done? And I'm also thinking about you know the audience. You've you've already referred to tailoring tailoring to the audience and the interests of, of the funders. But just in general, in terms of your writing strategies, do you have a different approach for writing proposals for funding than for other writing that you do? Well, I think there's researching the actual project or intervention, and there's also researching the funders. So as my colleagues have shared, ensuring that alignment and accounting for audiences, so whether it's a corporate funder, a private foundation, uh, a government entity, the writing is definitely nuanced. Um, and accounting for what what their interest in alignment and what are the components. So with the corporate funder thinking about employee engagement, is that something that's really important to them? Um, PR, right? With um, a federal or um, a state or city, it's a very, you know, character limits and there, there may not be a program officer to talk to and there's a cap in terms of how much you can say. So the preciseness is really important. Um, and then I think just really, making sure that the research is there in terms of alignment for the project, as well as you know, having enough research on the actual project. And then being able to take something that's very complex and being able to explain it in layman's terms. Yeah, I think particularly if you're working with community members, you have an idea for kind of the sorts of things that they're looking for. So when funding announcements comes out, come out, Usually the first thing I do is touch base with them to see if that's something that they might be interested in. And then we kind of work to come up with project ideas and draft aims for the research project. And then before we spend time writing a whole grant proposal, we usually try to touch base with someone at that funding organization and just send them the basic study aims to see if that's something that they'll be interested in before you, you don't want to spend all this time submitting a grant proposal that that the agency is not interested in. Um, so I would say work with your community collaborators closely, come up with an idea, and then present that to the funding agency first before you start start writing. So I'm the lucky one that gets to write on behalf of um, folks, right? Um, I'm not the one that's actually doing the the, the work once the grant comes. And so, uh, you know, me and, and the team will do significant research on foundations and other spaces that, um, and try and identify areas that we think or organizations um, that will be interested in some of the work that that faculty is doing. Um, um, in in my my previous role, it, it was similar, right? Just doing some some research to to identify ways in which um, it, areas or foundations that would be interested in, in the nonprofit work that we were doing. Um, but I, and I think the process in terms of the actual writing was still the same for me in the beginning, right? It's like a complete brain dump. I'm not worrying about the character limits. I'm not worrying about whether or not this is the intro versus the ending. I'm just getting everything out um, uh, to then um, to then format and, and structure and, and, and fine tune um, language after that. I also find though, right, when, and especially as I think about 
social work and advocacy and what we do and, um, and why foundations or philanthropy exists in the first place. Um, we have a, a unique opportunity and something that um, I've been grateful to be trained in and ensuring that the language that we're using is always asset-based and not leaning into some of the, the language that um, foundations and, and, and government grants are, um, are looking for when trying to um, identify a worthy project, right? And so what does it look like to talk about some of the um, issues of the world that we are looking to solve for um, and, not, um, and not blame the individual, but lift up the systemic problem instead, right? Um, what is it? How do we ensure that if we are telling someone's story within a grant um, or a proposal that we are asking permission before doing that? All things that feel very common sense, but not not things that are historically done um, within this space um, in any sort of real meaningful ways. Uh, and so there's a way in which to um, to both ensure that you are writing to what you think the funders needs are without doing it in a way that makes you feel yucky about it um, as an official term <laughs> um, uh, because you are kind of feeding into savioristic um, issues or, or other things that kind of come up in, in, the, in the funding space. I'll just quickly add, you know, echoing everything that was said, but also that it's okay that you might have a different relationship with different kinds of writing. So you may like some kinds of writing more. I like the grant writing. That's the ideas phase. That's the brainstorming. As Alyssa said, that's the, what might we achieve? And I really love that writing versus say empirical writing or report writing is this is what we did and this is what we found. I do not enjoy that part as much. And so it's really important to know when you work on a team, you might know who may want to take the lead on one part versus the other, or just knowing yourself, you may want to structure your time differently, knowing that a certain kind of writing might be more challenging for you than, than the other. Um, so just a quick note about different relationships with different kinds of writing. Really good points. Thank you. Um, you know, a couple of you have alluded to this notion of storytelling. And when I was first learning how to write a grant, story the word storytelling, I'm, I assure you, did not come up. Uh, and throughout, throughout my time doing this, I've come to realize how really critical that is in sort of passing the um, what some people call the so what test, right? Like, so, you know, what, what are you doing? So what, what does it matter? So I wonder if, if a couple of you might be willing to expand a little bit on how you use the, the tool um, or the resource of storytelling in trying to write a successful grant proposal. I mean, that's why it's so, it's part of, it's so wonderful to have someone like Lenara on the team and our whole team is that it's, you know, I've, I've had meetings with them. It's like, this is what I'm trying to say. This is what I'm trying to do. And then they craft a beautiful narrative about that. So I think it goes back to knowing your strengths and knowing where you need help and more support. So um, if you are a beautiful storyteller, but you have a hard time getting down to the details of what you're actually going to do, try and one, anticipate that and collaborate or collaborate with people who can help support you on that. And we're not all storytellers, but ultimately that's what you're doing. I think, Lenar, you said earlier, you're always speaking to humans on the other side. Um, they want to feel passion and interest and in that you're really invested in the work that you're proposing and you think it matters. And your story and narrative can be critical in conveying that, not just the details of the study or the project. And so I think building that skill set, emphasizing and understanding that, and or working with people who are stronger in that area is probably really um, important. And I think we can lose sight of that, especially say if it's federal funding, we feel like we have to have this dry tone and narrative and very matter of fact and very scientific. And I think it's actually a balance. Again, there are people reading your proposal, you want them to feel connected to you and your work. So narrative is very important. Yeah, I agree with Courtney. And I'll, I'll say that to kind of pull out that storytelling because grants can become very dense. And as Courtney said, people are people and they, don't always read all of the specific details. So anything you can do to make the storyline clearer, I think is very helpful. I will usually start by drafting kind of the significant section or important section with 
just the start of paragraphs, the first and kind of last sentence to make sure everything flows together and then highlight or bold that first sentence in each paragraph. So if a reviewer is busy and not paying close attention to the grant, even if they're just reading the main sentence of each paragraph, they get the overall story and they get why this is important. Um, so simplify things as much as possible for, for the reviewers. I really like this idea of the so what test. I think that storytelling can be really impactful and really emphasize the impact of what the program is. So when I think about when I've worked with program colleagues and they're so passionate about what the intervention is or what the program is, I get the benefit of being able to write that in a way which demonstrates the impact. And I think that's what storytelling can do. It's why does this matter? What will this do? How will this impact the community? How will this benefit the community? How will this benefit the community at large? Whatever the, whatever the intervention is. Thank you. Excellent. Anybody want to add on to that? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so we've got some great questions coming into the Q&A. So I'm going to start to, um, to address some of those now as well. Um, and somebody's asked a, a very specific question about connecting with funders. This is a real nuts and bolts question, I would say. Um, how explicit should you be when you connect with those funders? Do you share that you're interested in applying? And, uh, and there's another wrinkle here. What if you have a personal connection with the funder? Any thoughts on that? I think it really varies depending on the, the funding source. So for federal grants, for instance, they have a very formal structure. They have a, a project officer, program officer who oversees uh, the grants that are coming in, who have a sense again of the funding priorities and what types of projects they're most interested in. It is their job to talk to you about your work and whether it's the right fit. So you shouldn't hesitate to reach out to them. You absolutely should reach out to them and talk to them. I think private funding, um, uh, nonprofits can be a little bit um, different. I would say with, with private funders, um, it to me, it often feels like, and I think this is related to another question in the chat. It to me, it often feels like they're investing in people, um, and sometimes the idea, but they're really investing in the people. Where say federal funding is very specific in terms of the details of your project, and I found on the private side, um, those personal relationships, them knowing you and meeting you, become really, really important for what they're choosing to invest in. So they may not be as interested in the details or the technical aspects of the project as opposed to, no, I believe you and I want to invest in you. And so you need to know that. Whereas, you know, the National Science Foundation doesn't necessarily care so much uh, about that. And so I think you need to know that about the different kinds of, of funding. Um, it would be inappropriate to smooth with a PO from NSF in an effort to try and get funding completely expected for private uh, donors who you might meet at a cocktail hour. And just to build on that, you know, for if, if you have a personal relationship with someone in a, you know, at a foundation, um, that's always a great thing uh, to kind of get some insider insider knowledge there. Depending on the foundation, they'll will also determine what their process is, right? And so sometimes foundations will ask for a one pager that you know has you describe what your what you're actually looking to be funded for before you act you write your full um, your your full grant. Um, some uh, foundations will um, their board will have to to vote on on what actually moves forward. Um, and and in instances like that, relationships always matter, right? When when you have people advocating for your work and what you're doing and, and, and who you are within the space. Um, as Dr. Corbin has mentioned, federal funding is different. I, I have found though in my experience for um, federal funds for uh, nonprofits, uh, yes, there is a, a very formatted way in which um in which uh you are you're being assessed um and it could be multiple people reading different parts of your your grant so that the same person may not be reading it um, um and so putting a plug in for repetition in this moment as well i think that that is something that we learn not to do when writing essays if you've said something before you should not repeat it later on but like the, the point that you're trying to to make um and whatever you're looking to to fund you should say it multiple times in each section because you don't know who's actually reading that section, especially when you're thinking about federal funding. And the the overall package also matters, right? And so I've gotten 
um, elected officials to write letters of support for whatever we're looking to fund. Um, um, and, and not that it will, who knows whether or not there's a, a lot of sway in that, you know, but it, it does show um, the relationships that you have within the community that you are looking to serve and that um, your, your elected officials are support the work that you're doing as well um, as they, you know, do their ratings and scoring. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said, and I would just add a few a few things. One is that on the private side with program officers, it could be really helpful to share the program idea and share, like as Lenara said, with the concept paper, they can provide feedback on ways to make it stronger so that the board does approve of it for funding. So I've had many times where I've talked to program officers, corporate and private foundations, met with them, shared the idea, and then they help finesse proposal. So they provided like really valuable feedback, which then provided a positive outcome. And on the federal side, I'll add that sometimes there are peer reviewers of the proposal. And as Lenar said, you don't know who's reading what section. So there could be a panel of, re of reviewers reviewing your proposal and repetition is really important. And you may know some of the folks that are peer reviewers, so it doesn't hurt to reach out to them if you say, you know, they have a say and you get funding. Thank you all. Um, we have a couple of questions, I think, that strike the heart of what social work is, and that is uh, the role of, of social workers in the profession to promote social justice and expand equity um, wherever we go. And so a couple of questions on this. One has to do from the writer's side. Um, what opportunities or barriers exist um, in writing for funding? when you are trying to promote social justice. Uh, and someone else has asked that from the funders perspective, what ways can funders better center equity in grant making? So any, any thoughts on those sorts of ideas? I think the current structure that we've inherited in, in regards to, to funders and those that are receiving the funds, right? Is that there's a lot of having to prove to the funders um, that your work is relevant or, or what you're doing, right? Um, in ways that um, that at times can feel like if you're not reporting out on what it is that they want to hear that you, you may you may lose funding. I think that we are getting into this season where um, the philanthropic space is understanding better what it means to to trust the individuals who are doing the work, right? And not making us have to jump over hurdles to, um, to receive the, the funding and, um, and to keep it. Um, there's, there's still a long ways to go, but I, I do think that the, the power dynamic is shifting a little bit. Um, um, at, at least I've seen in, in the past um, couple of years. Um, so yeah, I will, I'll stop there. Okay. But uh, Alyssa. Yeah, so I would say with any research projects you're doing, make sure to include your collaborators and include them in an equitable way. These shouldn't just be an afterthought that you put on a grant to get funding. They should be involved with you throughout the whole process of setting up the grant, carrying out the grant. Um, if, well, not if possible, you should make it a priority to include them at least as a co-investigator, or I prefer to include someone from the community as a co-PI on my grant applications because you really need someone who has that local expertise and is tapped into the community, um, including making sure you have community advisory boards that are also helping um, to inform your work is very helpful. And then from a funder's perspective, I think definitely more needs to be done to address inequity, but I think there are some encouraging changes that I've been very happy to see. So more funding announcements out to address um, structural racism, for example, more funding announcements out specifically for community organizations, more funding announcements out specifically for people from marginalized backgrounds who um, have historically been underrepresented. So definitely take a look at those funding opportunities um, and, and apply for them because we do need more people in the field doing these types of work. And just to add to that, I think, you know, it's it's absolutely great that those uh, funding sources are expanding, but it also 
opened up some challenges where you have new people coming into a space where they're writing about racism now um, and they may not have the expertise they need to actually launch that project. So just like you engage community members who have expertise that you don't have, you also need to engage other scholars who might have deeper expertise in those areas to make sure you're not reinventing the wheel, that you're actually doing work that's moving the needle forward from where the work has already been. Um, and then what I write about in the, the paper um, is this tendency when you're in this space if your expertise outpaces where your reviewers are. So if you have a deep expertise in racism and they're now putting together a panel of reviewers to review racism related proposals, but you understand it in a more nuanced and complex way than they do, then someone who actually doesn't uh, understand all that complexity might be clearer in their writing of the proposal that's more aligned with how the reviewers are, think about and understand that work. And that your project may come across as convoluted or too complicated or not feasible because they're not familiar, as deeply familiar with the area of work. So I think that's an ongoing challenge, but ultimately it's up to you, the writer, to find the right mark, to clearly convey the importance of your ideas, but you may have an added challenge um, in depending on the, the funding climate. And just to build off of that, I would add two things. One is that as folks that are writing proposals, we have an opportunity to provide education to the folks reading. So a lot of times I've had questions from funders about nuanced issues that were happening in the nonprofit that I was involved with. And I was able to provide education and explanation as to why we're asking for funding for something that they didn't, it wasn't intuitive to them, right? So I think that we can provide some education. And I think Historically, proposals is all about making the best case for funding. And then in order to do that, you're showing a very dire situation, right? Where you're reinforcing some of the things we want to address, right? Reinforcing marginalized communities and things like that. So trying to take it more in a positive way, in an uplifting way, in the language we use and how we use the language, even if the funders aren't using that same language. We have an opportunity to use more uplifting language and ensure that we are really coming at it from a strength space. Thank you. Um, we're getting more more questions on nuts and bolts, but here's here's an interesting one because it's so uh, timely, I think. Um, we're asked, have any of you used chat GPT uh, to begin to draft sections of grant proposals that you are writing? Yeah, I see one nod. Alyssa, you have. Yeah, I have. So I mean, ventured in. <laughs> chat GPT is not like it's not going to write your proposal for you, unfortunately. Like that's that's not going to work. But I found Chat GPT useful for um, prompts for specific paragraphs. So, for example, if I'm in, if I'm writing a paragraph about barriers to some sort of healthcare access, I might type that prompt into chat GPT and see what it spits out. And sometimes it comes up with things that I didn't think about or weren't immediately at the top of my mind. Um, and then I can go do a deeper um, literature search on those specific topics and make sure that I'm addressing those in my grant. So those are things that I've found chat GPT helpful for. It's also very useful for coding as well. If you need it for data analysis, it can give you sample code that you can use in your analyses. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, you're way ahead, <laughs> as always. Um, that's exciting to hear. I hope it's useful. And the way you've said it sounds right. It can't come up with the basic ideas, but it can maybe point you to things you hadn't thought of. So um, that's helpful. Um, a number of folks are asking about grant writing resources. So, you know, where if I want to write a grant on such and such, where do I go? Um, and so I know there are some websites. Uh, if you're within Columbia University, there are some tools that are available to you. But I just wondered how how you all might answer that question. Uh, Columbia has uh, uh, access to a tool database called Pivot, which lets you search for uh, you know, federal, nonprofit, private organization funding based on topic, types of funding, et cetera. So I would take advantage of that. And there are other, I'm sure you all maybe have other suggestions for other types of databases where you can search for funding based on keywords, area of interest. Uh, and then for federal funding, 
and for foundations like the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, they all have big portfolios where they tend to invest in particular kinds of work. Um, and so you should have a sense of that and then keep them on your radar because they'll release different calls for different kinds of, of projects. But for the federal sites, you can go directly to say the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. There are lots of different institutes of health that have different areas of focus. You can go directly to their pages and again, search for what's been recently funded or funded previously, uh, calls for proposals right now. So someone in the chats uh, questions that they're interested in diabetes research, you can search for diabetes and current, uh, current um, requests for proposals or RFPs and anything related to that will come up to help you narrow it down. So leverage those existing uh, search engines for sure. And then another um, database is called GrantStation. Um, it's it's one that you have to pay for. Uh, they tend to have a lot of sales throughout the year as well. Um, so it's about a couple hundred bucks a year, uh, but it identifies, it allows you to research and look for um, grants from foundations and otherwise in, in other areas throughout the, the country as well. Yeah. And another tool is the Foundation Center Online Directory, which is also a paid um, requirement, but there are different libraries across the country that um, do provide free access to the foundations in our online directory in person. Uh, so depending on where you live, there may be one nearby, as well as like your local library may now have access to that. Yeah. And as um, Dr. Colum said, the, all the federal grants is all grants.gov. It's accessible to everyone. And depending on what state you live in, there are all lots of state agencies and city agencies. So in New York City, HHS Accelerator has all of the city grant opportunities. And Grants Gateway is in New York State, has lots of um, state opportunities as well. So depending on what your areas are focusing on or interested in, there are a lot of opportunities. In yeah, and I would also say the governmental organizations and a lot of the large foundations have sample grants posted as well. And sometimes they'll do webinars also um, about grant writing for their specific funding announcements. So definitely keep an eye out for those resources. It's really helpful to see models of what other people have written as you're thinking about your own work. I've used foundation, it used to be called foundationcenter.org, but I just looked for it and it appears now to be called candid.org. So uh, there, there are these things out there where you can start some paid for some open uh, and it's a great point that you can go to a library uh, and get access to, to some of these as well so um, so thank you and I, I realize time is getting short and there's a lot of questions here um, but uh, I really like let me go to this one um, how do you allow yourself to walk away from a piece of writing knowing that your proposal is written to the best uh, you can do you, do you rely on others to tell you when to stop and that really resonates with me because I could tweak forever <laughs> and um and, and that could be a challenge um yeah Alyssa I was going to say usually it's the deadline that determines it <laughs> it's like the grant is due tomorrow so it has to be done like it, whatever it is it is and it's going out I love that and also one of the things that we do on on the front end when writing a grant is create a checklist of all of the requirements <clears throat> that we are told needs to be in there like what we actually need to to answer. And um, if at least two people have checked off, yes, we have answered that. We we know that we won't be disqualified because of an unanswered question, right? Um, but to Dr. Davis's point, the what it sounds like um, or, or how it reads is probably to the final minute before submission. There are lots of questions too about courses in grant writing. Uh, and some of you have answered those. I think I think the answers that you've provided to individuals just go to those individuals. So just to know if you wanted to um, add a little bit more on where, if, if you've taken helpful courses in grant writing, or if you know of others, or perhaps we should put our heads together and put a, a list or you know some sort of resource available and we could send it out to folks who'd registered. But any thoughts on what would be useful? Over my, like for professional development throughout my fundraising career, the Lilly School of Philanthropy in Indianapolis is a place that I tend to go to quite a bit. Um, there are in-person um, courses as well as um, virtual ones, uh, but that tends to be a, a goal, a go-to for, for those in, in the fundraising world. But I don't know if there's something specific to, to higher ed and faculty that um, 
that you all have in mind. I, th I think things like this are really helpful. And of course, courses are helpful, but don't let that keep you from applying. Don't feel like you have to take a course or get a certification in order to be ready to write grants. The, the best training is doing it and practicing it and getting the feedback. Um, so yes, get all the support you can, but don't let that hold you up either from, from moving forward. Yeah, and I, you know, it, for people just starting out, this might not happen, but as you get into it a little bit, Folks will approach you to review grants, um, and that can be a really, really useful way to understand how to write grants. I think if you're on the other end, um, seeing the instructions that reviewers get, well, whether you get asked or not, you could log into, say, the NIH website, and they'll give you the instructions they give to reviewers. So it's helpful to read how exactly how the reviewers are going to be instructed uh, in, in evaluating what you write. Um, so, so that's an interesting uh, point as well. Let, let me ask you this. Um, you, one of you, at least one of you alluded to it, um, and I'll just say it, the fear of rejection. You do, as Alyssa said, you, you, you know, there are more grants that didn't get funded that did get funded, but how do you, how do you not take it personally and how do you move forward and, and make the best use of the feedback that, that you get from those opportunities? I think it's okay to take it personally, actually, and to kind of like go through go through the emotion in, in order to get to the other side. But what you said, Melissa, is really important in regards to feedback, right? I think that oftentimes we receive the rejection and then let it sit. Um, but you can email and, and ask for, for the why. You know, what about my proposal um, did not make it uh, to, the, to the final cut? Um, and more often than not, funders will, will explain, you know, the reasoning and, and and give some really really great feedback, um, and so I you know in in the beginning of my fundraising career I did, I did quite a bit of of that right getting getting rejected and then um, asking the why to then you know apply it next time and also send my in my feelings for a little bit um, as I I needed to to move forward. I think as social workers we are very aware of our environment and just being very aware of the fact that there's so many other variables as to why it didn't get funded so. I worked on this proposal that was beautiful, right? My colleagues and I all thought it was amazing. And it was actually awarded, but because of congressional restrictions, there wasn't funding available from the federal agency to provide it, right? So the proposal was beautiful, all of the components, the work plan, the timeline, but the funding wasn't there, right? So I think just being very cognizant of all of the variables that go into funding and why funding is available or not available, right? And could we then use that proposal for private funding? Could we ask someone else? Could we use those materials for other ways, right? So I think just being very cognizant of all of the different variables. Yeah. Go ahead, Alyssa, please. I was going to say at this point, I kind of just have like my own personal rejection processing protocol. I, I mean, you deal with it so often, you just have to kind of have ways to manage. And so I would say definitely ask for feedback if they didn't give it to you when they give you the rejection. And then make sure to take self-care and do what works for you. Oftentimes, I'll see the feedback that I get, and especially if it was something that I specified multiple times in a grant and a reviewer just wasn't paying attention, it's okay to feel angry and grumpy. And at that point, I'd, I'm going home, I'm having a glass of wine, I'm not going to look at this for a week, and then I'll revisit again next week and we'll revise and, re and think about plans for resubmission. But definitely find ways to take care of yourself because it does get exhausting at times. Thank you for that. I can't believe we have like two minutes left. So I'd like to close with this question and and, and each of you, if you could weigh in, I'd, I'd be really grateful. But um, as as we close this session down today, what advice have you gotten over the years uh, that really stuck with you? Uh, and what would you like to leave our audience with? So something something that you heard or came across or just learned by experience over the years that that you would like folks to know uh, as we as we end this session. Courtney, shall we start with you? Sure. I got this advice uh, in high school when I was applying to college and my SAT score didn't meet the average for the school I really wanted to go to. And another teenager said to me, make them tell you no. So if you don't apply, it's automatically no. So if you do apply, you at least have to force them to tell you no. So you have to throw your hat in the ring at some point and at least try. 
don't tell yourself no. Writing that down. Thank you. Uh, Anjali? Thank you. I think writing can be perfected over time. It takes practice and um, it's something that you can improve upon. It's not something that like everyone's born with. And if you're not a good writer, you know, don't do it. You can, you can get good at it and it takes time. That's great. That's great. Lenara. Yeah. Um, I've gotten a lot of advice over the years, but I'd, to be a good writer, um, you have to be an avid reader right? Um, and so reading is extremely important in that regard. And, and also to be a good writer, you just, you have to continue writing. Uh, just keep doing it. Definitely a persistence theme coming through. Alyssa, you got the last word here. Yeah, I would say if you're doing work that you're passionate about and that you feel is important, like others have said, don't give up, keep writing, keep practicing just because you get rejected once or multiple times doesn't mean you won't get funded eventually, you likely will, but you have to stick with it long enough and, and keep practicing. And if the work is important, make sure that you do stick with it. All fantastic advice. It is, I can't believe one o'clock, um, but I just wanna thank you all for sharing your expertise and experience and wisdom uh with us I, you know it, it doesn't matter i think where you are in the um in your process of development as a writer you always benefit by hearing from other writers uh and learning what we've all walked through uh and and the struggles we faced and how we we overcame them so big applause to all of you thank you um and thank you adam and chin for bringing together this great session on uh, this series it's it's always a, a great joy to be here thank you everyone for joining us Thanks, everyone. Good luck. Happy writing.